First World War presented Newfoundland and Labrador with a management problem. How could a small dominion that had little money and even less military experience launch and sustain an effective war effort? Yet it was determined to do just that. Three days after the war broke out on August 4, 1914, Newfoundland Governor Sir Walter Davidson wired London. He suggested that the Dominion would raise a regiment of 500 volunteers. London agreed. It was a big commitment and the Dominion's government was not immediately sure how to meet it. There were no professional soldiers in Newfoundland and Labrador, and the government didn't even have a military department. There were other obstacles too. Prime Minister Sir Edward Morris was in a weak political situation. His People's Party had lost important seats to the Union and Liberal parties in the 1913 general election. If he was to orchestrate a war effort that would not ruin his political career, then he would need the support of both opposition parties. He would also need the backing of key public figures, most notably the leaders of the Roman Catholic, Anglican and Methodist churches. Securing their unified support would be no small feat in a society deeply and historically divided along religious lines. Morris's tenuous hold on power made him question the benefits of creating a state-run military department. If the government managed the war effort, then there would be more debate in the House of Assembly and likely more public controversy. Instead, he decided to form a non-partisan volunteer organization. Governor Davidson supported the move. Both men hoped that a neutral association would remove party politics from the war effort and unite people from different religious affiliations. They also believed it was the fastest and cheapest way to get the job done. A new government department would require far more time and resources to create than a volunteer organization would. And in 1914, it was widely believed that the war would be over by Christmas. The new group became known as the Newfoundland Patriotic Association, or the NPA for short. It formed at a public meeting in St. John's on August 17, 1914. Governor Davidson became its leader, and its members were some of the most influential people in the Dominion. Religious leaders joined, so did politicians from the People's Party and the opposition Liberals. Merchants, lawyers, and doctors joined, alongside newspaper editors, city councillors, and officials from the Newfoundland Royal Naval Reserve and local paramilitary groups. The association was concentrated in St. John's, but outport magistrates, journalists, politicians, and doctors also formed branches in 45 rural communities. Notably absent from the NPA's membership was William Coker. He was the leader of the Union Party, which won eight seats in the 1913 general election. It was the first political party in Newfoundland that represented working-class voters, like fishers, sealers, and loggers. The party was strongest in outport districts along Newfoundland's northeast coast, and its popularity was spreading. Davidson and Morris had invited Coker to join the NPA, but he refused. He thought the government was ignoring its responsibilities by allowing a private organization to manage military matters. But Coker was in the minority. The NPA enjoyed extensive support from Newfoundland's political, commercial, and social elite, and from the St. John's public in general. The government willingly allowed the group to take charge of the war effort. The NPA's first and founding role was to establish a Newfoundland regiment. It created various committees to take on specific tasks, such as recruiting, training, officer selection, and finance. As new needs became apparent, more committees formed. The NPA's responsibilities quickly expanded to include virtually every aspect of Newfoundland's war effort. It became responsible for soldier pensions, veterans hospitals, and civil reestablishment programs. It also helped to recruit volunteers to the Newfoundland Forestry Corps and the Newfoundland Royal Naval Reserve. The first year and a half of the association's existence went by relatively smoothly. Finding enough recruits was not a problem, and the NPA did a good job of uniting the different political parties and religious groups under a common cause. But the war dragged on far longer than anyone anticipated. Administrating the Dominion's role in it proved to be unexpectedly complex. 
By the summer of 1916, the NPA was struggling to maintain the Newfoundland Regiment at full battalion strength. The NPA itself contributed to the recruiting problem because it failed to connect with Outport residents in a meaningful way. Few of its 45 Outport branches existed for more than a year. The NPA remained an essentially St. John's-based organization. It did not recognize the significant economic and geographic barriers that prevented Outport residents from enlisting. Rural households depended on the seasonal cod fisheries for their livelihoods. If the men left their homes to enlist, then they risked plunging their families into poverty. But the NPA provided no financial aid to offset this problem. It was a different story in the city, where some businesses promised to not only reserve jobs for employees who enlisted, but to also top up their military pay so it would equal their usual salaries back home. The government's weak presence in rural areas also undermined the NPA's ability to enlist volunteers. This became clear to a recruiter who visited Sops Island in White Bay in October of 1916. He couldn't enlist a single person in the community and later described the situation to the Evening Telegram. Sops Island is a terribly isolated place. For all the public service the residents get, they might well be forgiven if they fail to appreciate that they belonged to any empire or to any group of persons outside of themselves. Other problems also plagued the NPA. Wounded soldiers began to return home in 1916, but there were no effective military pension or work placement programs in place to help reintegrate them into society. Some of the men began to publicly criticize the NPA. Some local newspapers called upon the government to replace the association altogether. There is much condemnation, and apparently justly so, of the manner in which our wounded and invalided soldiers and sailors are being treated. In the defense of their country, they have suffered severely. Some have lost limbs, others have been grievously injured. Within a few days of their return, they receive their discharge and are paid what small balance may be coming to them, and are then left wholly unprovided for, unless they think fit to approach the Patriotic Association and ask for aid. These things should not be. The government, anxious and properly so, to keep the war administration free from the remotest tinge of party bias, have delegated their powers to those removed from party ties and influences. These have done good work, and the country is grateful. But they, or whoever among them may be responsible, have failed at a moment when failure is a serious evil. Let the government then step in, put the matter on a fair basis, see to it that our heroes are treated as they should be. The NPA also came under fire for the way it selected regiment officers. Critics accused it of favoring St. John's men over outport men, Protestants over Catholics, and the sons of the well-off over those from working-class families. In some cases, the NPA even awarded commissions to inexperienced new recruits who came from prominent families instead of experienced but working-class men in the field. The Daily News published a letter from an anonymous soldier who described the situation from the front lines. There are able-bodied men attached to the base and headquarters in Scotland who should be in the trenches in France, relieving the men who have borne the heat and burden of the fray during the whole course of the war. They are there who have never saw the flash of the Huns' rifles, who have never been any nearer than air to the firing line, who are enjoying the times of their lives in comfortable quarters, drawing pay as privates, corporals, sergeants, lieutenants, and captains the majority of them in much better physical condition for the firing line than many of the long servicemen now there. Even more damaging were accusations that some of the NPA's own members were abusing their positions to profit financially from the war. It had to do with shipping. The Newfoundland economy relied on the importation and exportation of goods, but in 1915, some local merchant firms began to sell many of their largest steamers to Russia. That country needed the vessels to safeguard its northern waters. It was a good opportunity for the merchants because the ships were expensive to maintain. But their sale decreased the number of local vessels available to import goods to Newfoundland and Labrador, like flour, coal, and salt. Shortages of these and other products followed, and their prices rose. 
Rumors soon spread that the merchants were using their control over the import, wholesale, and retail trades to obtain the highest possible margin of profit. Many of the merchants implicated were NPA members. William Coker became one of the most vocal critics of what he called the profiteering merchants. If the public knew one half of what is going on in official circles the past few months, they would stand appalled. They have been asked to contribute to collections for patriotic purposes. They have been asked to make many sacrifices which they have done with true British spirit. But in return for all this, they find themselves at the mercy of a ring of commercial grafters. Prime Minister Morris appointed a High Cost of Living Commission to investigate the allegations. Its findings confirmed Coker's suspicions. In the case of flour alone, the commission found that the merchants had made at least $600,000 in excess earnings. Dealers had hoarded supplies and charged unreasonably high prices. Merchants usually made a profit of 50 cents per barrel, but during the war, they made up to $4 per barrel. The commissioners could find no reason to justify such large rate increases. The NPA's reputation was badly damaged. All three political parties agreed that it was time for the government to step in. Morris formed a national government in July of 1917. It combined the People's Party, the Union Party, and the Liberals under a single coalition administration. But not long after, and with little notice, Morris moved to England and accepted a seat in the House of Lords. His sudden resignation from Newfoundland politics was badly timed. The Dominion was at war and its government in disarray. Some politicians and newspapers criticized Morris for placing his own personal ambition above the public good in such troubled times. Liberal leader William Lloyd stepped in as the new prime minister, and his coalition government worked quickly to address the problems that had plagued the NPA. It introduced a business profits tax and an income tax to deal with the profiteering merchants. It formed a department of militia to replace the NPA and to take over the war effort. And in the spring of 1918, it introduced conscription. Unmarried, healthy men between the ages of 19 and 25 now had no choice but to join the Newfoundland Regiment. But debate surrounding conscription was heated and divisive. It undermined the cohesiveness of the national government. In the end, conscription wasn't even necessary. No drafted soldier was put into action before peace was restored on November 11, 1918. By the time the war ended, the national government was beginning to fragment. Some of its members had already broken away and formed an opposition. The new Catholic archbishop also undermined the coalition's authority by publicly opposing William Coker. The government collapsed in May of 1919 when Finance Minister Michael Cashin successfully introduced a no-confidence motion. Party politics and denominational tensions were once again at the fore of Newfoundland politics. <laughs>